she was unhappy. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much to Debbie and Oscar Holger for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure. It's lovely to see so many friendly faces. Um, I think everybody's been in, actually, before we had the conversation. But I'll just reiterate, uh, this is a conversation. Uh, you know, uh, so throw questions at me when you want. Uh, I'll try and answer as best as possible. Um, and, yeah. So, we'll begin. All right, so alternative photography. So, to really kind of start to understand what alternative or how you could define alternative photography, I think we need to take you back to kind of the origins of what photography is or where photography came from, right? So, there is, now apologies to my wife who's uh, sort of stolen part of her PhD here, uh, it says there are three core areas with how photography was invented, right? Or how it's discovered, right? First of all, as a scientific or a technological breakthrough. Now, a lot of the people who wanted to, or wanted to fix images of a camera obscura, that's basically where people started uh, create, wanting the drive to create photography, right? So camera obscuras, you guys know what camera obscuras are? Yeah. So you can create a camera obscura uh, by just uh, you know blacking out your front room and putting a little hole in the window, actually in the window, but you know blacking it out bin bags and then a little hole. And you can create a camera obscura everywhere. And these have been created since uh, you know two, three thousand years ago. I mean, there's examples of ancient Chinese camera obscuras. Now, whether they were invented on purpose or developed on purpose, whether they just were created by accident, is not entirely known, but at least for the last three or four hundred years, people have been creating camera obscuras, and then there's been a drive to see how you can fix the image of the camera obscura. So you'd see the image, it'd be upside down and back to front, and it'd be projected on the wall, but how do you, how do you take that and how do you fix it? So that was one of the drivers. Uh, one of the other drivers was business. Now, uh, Thomas Wedgwood, who will go in the next slide, uh, who I'm sure you all know as uh, the chap who made the blue plates. He was also an extremely good businessman, as I'm sure you understand, it's persisted today. Uh, he wanted to mass produce images on his plates and his pottery. He wanted to find a way of mass producing images. And he experimented a lot with different processes, never quite managed to fix the image, but he, he wanted to mass produce it. So, uh, uh, and then people like uh, Daguerre created photography as a way of uh, creating a spectacle. Right? So these are three kind of drivers for creating photographic image at the beginning. Right? Uh, and so, what you have at the beginning of photography is something called simultaneous invention or, or multiple discovery as well. Uh, and this is a fairly well known um, effect whereby where there's uh, technological advances around the same time, people will tend to discover or invent things simultaneously but separately around the world, okay? So, most of these people were working around 1840s, 1850s and uh, started developing photography. We all like to claim, us Brits that is, that Fox Talbot uh, uh, invented photography and of course the French uh, like to claim that uh, Degas uh, created photography. But of course there were other people like Hercule Florence uh, in Brazil uh, Herschel, who was a contemporary of Fox Talbot, who developed um, uh, cyanotype processes and also arguably invented photography by developing the fixer. Uh, so he, he, he arguably discovered the thiosulfide fixed, it's a technical, the thiosulfide fixed silver, and so arguably Herschel's really the inventor of photography. Uh, 
uh, in the UK, not for Sawood, but uh, you know, it's a matter of discussion. But Hershey also developed the cyanotype, which Anna Atkins uh, exploited just a, a year later. He wants to get one woman in there. He's, um, uh, and then Thomas Wedgwood, who uh, developed the silver prints um, and did it. And, yeah. and then uh, another chap, Hippolyte Bayard, who it is argued invented photography before Daguerre, but just didn't publish it before him, so nobody's ever heard of it. Which is uh, the way it is with most invention. Now, Fox Talbot was very much a scientist, uh, and he uh, developed it. Uh, you know, uh, if you have a chance uh, to go to Fox Talbot House, which is in the name now escapes me, down on the A4. Look it up, yeah. Um, beautiful country house. Uh, it's got a fantastic photography museum. Uh, and so he was, he was uh, you know, archetypal, aristocratic, uh, scientist, uh, man, you know, Renaissance man, interested in lots of different things. Uh, and he was playing around with Thomas Herschel uh, with silver salts um, and trying to find a way of fixing them. Right? Uh, and he did develop a way of uh, creating a fixed photographic image and also one that was just about quick enough to be able to use with a camera or be with painfully long exposure. Um, but he was very much interested in uh, photography as a scientist. Right? Uh, so he uh, was back here. So he was very interested in scientific, scientific recording part of photography. And uh, the first images he did were uh, images of sculptures or pieces of artwork to, or, or bones or things like that. He was interested in recording things scientifically. Um, Hercule Florence and also Thomas Wedgwood, they were looking at it in terms of more of uh, business sense. So they were interested in mass production. Uh, and then Daguerre, uh, and I think Daguerre is arguably the most interesting of the inventors of photography, and also arguably the first one. He got there first. He told everyone. He he, he told everyone was there first. Daguerre started off uh, as a showman. He used to create light shows. So he used to uh, project images through magic lanterns. Uh, he used to create smells and lights and smoke, and he created this uh, these extraordinary. Uh, light and sound shows, right? Uh, and what he wanted to do was to find a way of doing that, of projecting images that he created before, rather than using shadows and some smoke. So he wanted to create, basically, he wanted to create a more elaborate spectacle. Right? So, uh, and then, uh, the image I've got here is from Hippolyte Bayard. Now, Hippolyte, uh, arguably created photography first, before Daguerre, before Fox Dolbert, but kept it secret, um, and didn't tell anyone about it, and didn't publish, and then Daguerre got there first. And so, in a fit of peak, he created what is possibly the first artistic photographic image, uh, and also possibly this first, one of the, not the first, but one of the first selfies, uh, which is a self-portrait of a drowned man. Uh, so, <laughs> what happened was that he was so pissed off that the gear got there first that he made a picture for himself as a man who was destroyed, a man who was drowned. De Gare had drowned his ambition, his aspiration. Uh, so this is, you know, it's 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 uh, it's a bit of shade, but it, it's also kind of arguably the first uh, uh, artistic selfie. Okay, so these are these are the beginnings of. Um, beginnings of photography. So, so what, what is photography? I mean, what, what do you guys think photography is? Has anybody got any ideas? I mean, I've got some ideas here. I mean, is, is it scientific? Is it the recording of scientific, uh, you know, is it about recording things and making realistic recordings of things? Uh, or, or is it just technology? I mean, your digital camera is extraordinarily complex. Your phone is extraordinarily complex. You know, it, it can do all sorts of things. You know, you can arguably create professional images with your mobile phone. Yeah. Does anybody? What do, what do people think here? What, what is photography to you? 
Okay. Next one, anthropology. So, uh, you know, since uh, photography has been invented, people have used it uh, anthropologically, archaeologically, to record, I mean, archaeologically to record uh, buildings and stuff like that, but also to record people. It's been used in all sorts of horrible ways anthropologically, you know, it's been used to promote uh, uh, ideas of eugenics, it's, uh, you know, been used to promote uh, ideas of uh, uh, biological determinism, terms of body shapes, and all sorts of horrible things. But it's also been used to record people throughout the world, so, you know, and how, and also social anthropology, so it's used to record the way people act and the way people interact. Um, was it truth or fiction? Since the beginning, since the beginning of photography, people have manipulated photography. People have manipulated images. Uh, we don't need to go very far back to see that people are still manipulating images. In fact. We can argue that all images now are complete fiction. There's no image which isn't manipulated. Uh, is it showmanship? Is it spectacle? Is it art? Personal experience? Politics? Uh, I've, I've missed out. Is it uh, commercial endeavour? Is it uh, advertising? Is it sales? Is it selling you something? Anybody have any ideas about? Is it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of everything, really. I mean, it depends on the purpose behind it as well. I mean, yeah. what your, your motives are for yeah. what you're doing. I mean, obviously, an anthropologist is <laughs> quite keen to document what they're, they're seeing in as truthful a way as they can possibly represent. Mm -hmm. But there are those who will take it to the fictional side of things and, you know, warp it, twist it. Mm -hmm. So I think, to some extent, it's a bit of everything, if you like. You know, yeah. I don't think there is an answer to that with today's technology. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It, it, it can be almost anything, you know. There's, to be able to say what is photography is it's basically it's kind of impossible, right? Uh, but that's kind of really difficult, different to quite a lot of other mediums, which we can kind of pinpoint more closely in terms of how they're defined. So you know. Um, Photography, in a way, sort of exists in this perpetual identity crisis. It started off as so many different things, sort of perhaps a science, perhaps a showmanship, perhaps art, a personal expression. Uh, and it was never really, we never really pinpointed what it ended up being. So photography, since its inception, has been in a constant state of identity crisis. What is it? Who's a photographer? What's a photographer? Um, so, what is alternative photography? Now, I haven't put a lot here because I think your answer to what is probably going to be anything kind of defines this. So, alternative photography in a way is nothing, right? Because photography can be anything. But at the same time, it can be anything, right? I think the best way to describe, I mean, the way that I describe alternative photography is if you exploit the mediums at your disposal in a way which is different to how they're meant to be used. So if you use your digital camera in a way that's different to how it's meant to be used, or you exploit your film in a way that's different to how it's meant to be used, or uh, you know, even if you play around the computer in a way that it's not meant to be used, that's alternative photography. And so I want to, you guys to sort of be aware that photography is limited only by your imagination. Uh, and I think if you do anything that exploits your imagination, exploits your materials, then you're doing alternative photography. A lot of people in the last 10 years have wanted to create a divide between analog and digital. I've always rejected that. I, I've never believed that there's any legitimate reason to separate analog and digital mediums, right? They are just two expressions of the same thing. Um, and should just be treated as two different expressions of the same medium. Right? So, of course, arguably, just because nobody really uses, well, very few people use analog photography in a commercial sense nowadays, arguably that's alternative now, whereas digital is the commercial medium. Right? 
But, but I think, but I think the distinction is unhelpful, um, and I think that to be really creative with your photography, you need to be be able to embrace all the different mediums at your disposal. Um, so, my feeling is it doesn't make any sense to create separation. Um, also, this the negative, so you can use it in the digital version. Exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly uh, the next point with mixed media. Um, now, mixed media can mean a whole load of things. I mean, you could you could be uh, doing uh, photography and sculpture or uh, printing on a brooch or whatever. But it, it can also mean uh, combining analog and digital. So making, doing analog printing with digital negative, which is a fantastic way of exploring the different uh, daylight printing techniques, Victorian printing technique, techniques, or just silver gelatin techniques by using digital negatives, your digital images uh, and printing out negatives, uh, and or for some techniques indeed printing out positives, uh, depending on the technique. Um, and also, uh, something I found on Facebook, which I must never use anymore, uh, I'm alone there, <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, saw, I saw a photographer had taken a digital fa uh, digital print, uh, and he'd. I'm not entirely sure what he did with it, right? Uh, but uh, he said that it involved uh, a gum of agave and an oven uh, and various scalpels, uh, and he produced this. Uh, this is actually a friend of mine, Daniel Eaglesong, who's a, a, a filmmaker, and his wife, uh, and the photographer Peter Searle. Uh, I asked him if I could use the image and get back to me, so if he doesn't mind or is in here. Um, but this uh, looks very much like a wet plate image, but it is a digital image, and what I can see, from what I can see, I think he's started to manipulate the gelatin of the digital print, so it's starting to, start to come apart here at the edges, I think he's starting to peel it off. So he's basically turned the two-dimensional digital print into a three-dimensional object by, by playing around with it physically, by scratching it, by bringing it out. And this is a fantastic example of alternative photography. It's brilliant. He's, uh, he's taken an image, he's printed it out, and then he's played around with the material and messed it up and created something completely unique. It's a beautiful example of mixed-media alternative photography. Uh, uh, I think it was just an experiment, but I really hope he does more of these. They're, they're really good. I really like that. It would be great to do a course in that, actually. Mm -hmm. should, should get him in to, do, to teach us. I'd love to learn how to do that. Um, okay, so, second, okay, so, discuss a little bit about what is alternative front. So, the second part of this talk, I'm just going to sort of go through some of the things that I think are alternative photography, right? Um, it's by no means comprehensive. Uh, I, as I went through this, I started to realise that I could make, you know, two hundred slide presentation with all the different, uh, all the different techniques. Actually, Graham, so I had a few books which uh, you guys can look at later. Um, this one in particular, which is. Uh, this is this is one of the classics of alternative photography, Keepers of Light. Uh, it's really hard to get hold of, um, but it has pretty much uh, every single uh, historical technique in it. Uh, it's fantastic, uh, really good introduction. Uh, there's another one called Spirits of Salt, if you want to do that. That's written by the chap that started Silver Print and somebody else. What's his name? He escapes me as well. Um, he's still around. He's now connected with Process Supplies, who down in Farringdon, was a great supplier of um, of materials. Spirits of salt, yeah. yeah. And Chippendale. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the house is beautiful. It's definitely worth a visit. Okay, so moving still images. Um, there's loads of different ways of doing this. Uh, the most common, of course, is you guys all do with your iPhones, I'm sure, 
are these images that you, you take a picture and it takes several images and then the image moves. But that's a still image that also moves. Right? That's, it seems kind of everyday, it's very prosaic now because everybody does it, but, but it's actually very weird if you think about it because it's, it's a still image but it's a moving still image. Right? So it's actually sitting in between film, photography and narrative. It's telling a story at the same time as being a still image. But it isn't by any means new, uh, and uh, stereo photography has been around since the beginning of, uh, the beginning of, how do I, uh, Okay, so um, stereo photography has been around since since the beginning of photography, and uh, you had stereo uh, uh, stereo de daguerreotypes. Um, can anybody guess what they were of? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Naked girls, of course. <laughs> Erotic imagery. <laughs> it's the first thing that you want to create a, a, a stereo image of is, of course, erotic image. Um, it's, uh, and it was the main driver for stereoscopy. Um, I created this image in a Sputnik camera. And Sputnik is a Russian stereographic camera. Uh, and uh, it creates two medium format 6.6 images. Uh, and it looks like a little box like this, it has two little lenses in the front, it's got a slider at the bottom, it changes your aperture, it looks like a little face, and it takes two images that are separated pretty much by the space, this sort of space in between your eyes. Right? So it's actually almost pretty equivalent to your eyes. And so what you end up creating is two slightly shifted images. Now, if you put your hand here, like this, yeah, and try and uh, block there, you might be able to see that as a stereoscopic image. Okay? Now, you know why you need to do this, right? Because what you're doing, you're basically creating a buff between the eyes. So, if you do this, you actually can't see your hand properly, right? Because what you're doing is you're blocking off the split between your eyes, okay? the space between the, where the images cross over, you need to do a little bit more. So you're kind of blocking off the space where the images cross over. You, you might, if you walk around like this, you might fall over because you're actually not what you're seeing in three dimensions. Um, of course, an easier way to see this is, here we go, I'll create a GIF. So you can see that there. And that gives you the impression of a 3D image. It actually looks like a 3D image. Right. Yeah, it takes the image at the same time. It's just it's just simulating. So yeah, so if you if you do that and then uh, close your eyes like that, you see that the you you see slightly different images, right? So your brain's an amazing three-dimensional computer machine that uh, takes the two images, flips them, mirror images them, and turns them into a three-dimensional image. So your brain sees the impression of 3D, right? But each individual eye is seeing a two-dimensional image. Right? This is why if you walk around with one eye closed or you have a problem with the eye, you, know, you might get the impression that you are seeing in 3D, but actually you're extremely likely to walk into things and you have no depth of perception. It's the combination of the images, it's that bit that you're seeing there where the images are combined gives you perception, perception of depth. Try it out, you know, close one eye and try and catch a ball. Extremely difficult to do. It's, it's, it's we're what, all going to be doing that. I hope that works. But no, I mean, you don't get, any, you don't get depth of perception with one eye, so you, you'll, you'll find it very difficult to do. Now, of course, the brain is an amazing thing. Like I said, you know, when, when you, when the eye, when the light goes into the eye, it works like a lens. So 
the image in the back of your brain is upside down and back to front. And your brain flips that and gives you the three-dimensionality. So you have an extraordinary computer in your brain that, that does all these amazing things. But of course, this is to some degree learnt. Now I, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I don't know at what point the brain works it out, but I, I'd, I'd say pretty sure with a very young baby, they, they haven't worked all that out yet. Right? So you can get these glasses, or if you get glasses that flip your world, right? so make everything appear upside down, after three days, your brain flips it back. So when you take the glasses off, everything's upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I haven't tried it out. So <laughs> if somebody likes to try it out, tell me that's, uh, where are we going again. It's very dope. Sure. Do you like to come on over? Yes. Okay. I Um, now, photography can also be a form of imaging technology. Uh, and one of the great ways of doing this is rendering 2D images as 3D images, which is basically uh, production of uh, 3D images. Let me go back to the... There we go. Yeah. So this is one I produced earlier. Uh, and this was created by uh, about three, two, so about 200 still images of a spindle wall. Now, a spindle wall is a object about this big, a uh, Roman object. This is a Roman object, so about 2,000 years old. Uh, well, maybe 1900, from early Rome, Britain. Uh, and it's used at the bottom of a loom, basically, it's a loom weight. Um, uh, and so this sort of imagery, you can create extremely good three-dimensional images of objects. Now people use this, uh, especially in archaeology, uh, or starting to use it more to allow people to immerse themselves in objects or in three-dimensional spaces. And there's loads of them, Sketchfab is definitely worth having a look through, uh, just because uh, there's absolutely loads of things. This is brilliant, this is a fantastic use of photography, it's a commercial use of photography, but it's still alternative photography, so what you're doing is taking, you know, about 200 here, yeah, uh, maybe a little bit less, but yeah, around, I think we did around 200 here, um, to create, um, amazing. Uh, yeah, a, a three-dimensional image of extremely high definition, three-dimensional image of the material. So you can see right inside yeah. all the... Yeah. Uh, and people use this to create three-dimensional images of uh, archaeological sites as well. And so you can do it in layers so you can walk through them, uh, create three-dimensional images of buildings, all sorts of things. It's a fantastic use of uh, 3D imaging technology. Um, Okay. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later to talk about imaging technology. But uh, I've got to, uh, okay. So you can also have a look at uh, different wavelengths. Now, uh, we usually look at photography with the visible wavelengths, right? Uh, so that's what our eye sees. Our eye sees the visible range. Okay. Uh, but if we start using different wavelengths, we can start seeing the world in different ways. Right? Now, a lot of Victorian vintage processes, uh, some of which I'm going to talk about uh, later on in the presentation, uh, use UV sensitivity. That's one example of using uh, different wavelengths. Right? Um, wet plate palladium, I'll show you uh, an image later. In which that, that's a 3D image, it's a wet plate image. Um, is uh, an in-camera process. So the image you take, you take inside, so the image you get is the one you take inside the camera. 
So basically, what you get is a negative, which, when you uh, have a dark background to it, gives you an impression of a positive. Right? So under, underexposed negative, a dark background gives you the impression of a positive. Yeah? Um, but one of the problems with that process is that it's UV sensitive. Right? Now UV, as we all know, because we put sun cream on, penetrates the skin. Right? So if we think about what visual light is, visual light, why do we see color? Why do we see people's faces? Right? Why do we see hands or objects? We see them because light reflects them. If we turn all the lights off, we wouldn't see anything. Right? So we see things because light reflects off things. Right? Uh, so that's what that's the same. The, the camera film or the camera sensor sees things because light reflects off them. Right? So if the camera sensor is sensitive to a light which penetrates below the skin, then what we're going to see is, okay, it's sensitive to normal light as well, but it's also sensitive to UV. So what we're going to see is also a little bit underneath the skin. So if you have thin skin or disease or blotching or whatever, it's extremely <laughs> unflattering. Uh, so yeah. You know, if somebody shoots your wet plate, make sure they slightly overexpose you so it blows out any imperfections, because otherwise it's extremely unflattering. So that's the same as freckles? Yeah, they come out massively, yeah. Yeah, they will do, yeah. And, and freckles you didn't even know you had. Yeah. <laughs> Which is uh, a particularly unflattering process. It's very sexy the moment wet plate. It's a great process. It's definitely worth playing around with, but uh, flattering it's not. Of course, you can overexpose and then you blow those things out uh, and you get a sort of slightly kind of um, yeah, slightly whitish appearance, and that uh, it's one way of doing it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not the most flattering of uh, processes. But you know, if you like looking very rugged, it's a great process. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I took a picture of my stepson who's who was 15, uh, and he looked just 28. You know, rugged 28-year-old. His uh, yeah, mother didn't like. <laughs> you. Um, also, you have uh, infrared sensitive film and infrared sensitive digital. Infrared sensitive film, this is uh, an example. Um, it's not just sensitive infrared, it's obviously sensitive to the visible range, but it's also sensitive to infrared. And so, whenever you see something where greens are all reds, all you have is color infrared. Uh, in black and white, uh, all your greens look very white. Uh, it's also sensitive to heat, right? so infrared is, is basically heat. Right? So it's uh, you can do quite interesting thermal images with it. Um, infrared digital, uh, I believe you get some cameras which are specifically designed to be sensitive to infrared. Now, of course, every single digital camera is sensitive to infrared and has a filter to block out the infrared. So. Whether that's true still, I don't know, and the main sensors might technology. But it used to be that every single digital camera had a filter that blocked out the infrared, right? So what you could do if you uh, were good with the electronics and didn't electrocute yourself was go in and remove the infrared filter and you create an infrared digital camera. And uh, there's uh, various good uh, technology hack sites out there which can show you how to do that, and show you how to remove the uh, infrared filter, and they're definitely worth looking at. It's good fun. If you have a camera, you have to kind of light, of course. Uh, this is, um, I believe, a picture of Cambodia um, by a chap called Sean Lynch. He does a lot of infrared photography. Um, and I, I quite like them, I don't know. I mean, I so like, quite like the. Uh, some people think they've just uh, done a Photoshop, but they're not. It's just that uh, foliage ends up looking red in colour infrared. Um, there's very little colour infrared film left out there. There's uh, one chap who has a batch of it, uh, and uh, if you write to me, I'll send you his details. Uh, he'll send out an email every now and then and release another batch, and you get little scraps of infrared film that you can feed into your cameras and use. Um, 
Uh, you, you'd usually... What is this? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. He's, he's got the last batch of infrared film, basically, that was ever produced. Uh, and uh, he'll, he'll sell you scraps of it. So, I mean, you know, you'll, it's really random, yeah. But, like, I, I, is expensive. It's extremely expensive. It's ridiculous. But, I mean, you know, I've, I've still got scraps of it in the fridge, you know, which I haven't used yet. But, yeah. Or, or he sells you, like, a small strip of 35 mil that you've got to feed into your own spool in a dark room, of course. In the dark bag. Um, whether it's worth it or not, I don't know. I mean, sure, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. So. What do you think of Richard Marsden's stuff then? Would, would that Richard Marsden be quite after or do you know Richard Marsden? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, it rings a bell, yeah. It's it's a similar sort of stuff, yeah. yeah. And was it over in was it Rwanda or something? Yeah, that's right. The, 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 war, the war of Congo. Yeah. yeah. That's right, and all the war images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. In Inferno or whatever it's called. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I do like that one. Yeah. Actually. And I think it works. I think, yeah, and I think, I think, I don't know, like, there's a simplicity to it, isn't it? Because foliage ends up being red and it's sort of war and you've got child soldiers and all these sort of things. So, you know, you're looking at sort of, you know, the, the world is bleeding in a way. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's simple, but it's powerful. It's, so powerful. it's really powerful, and uh, I think lots of things are simple like that. They're powerful. If it works, then yeah, no, I really like it. Mm. Yeah, it's really strong. Okay. Now, this is an image from a uh, news report. So you might see about three days ago. This is uh, they discovered Mayan civilization in the rainforest. Which archaeologists might go, we're so embarrassed, we've been walking over this for the last 20 years. Uh, and there's, uh, there's a huge, basically, walking over this village. Now, LIDAR, uh, does anybody know what LIDAR is? Yeah. Okay, so what you have is an aeroplane, and you have this bank of lasers underneath the aeroplane, and they go and they scan the ground. Right? Now, because they're constantly scanning backwards and forwards as the aeroplane goes across, Effectively, it makes foliage invisible. So you can you can scan tiny changes in the ground through extremely dense jungle, which is otherwise wasn't possible. And you can do it through dense jungle, through forest, through all sorts of places. And people have discovered all sorts of things through it. Uh, and so this is it's it's a it's a form of it's kind of like sonar. It's, it's laser sonar basically. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this was in the news three days ago, or three or four days ago, and they discovered a huge Mayan city in a forest. Um, this is great alternative photography. I mean, basically, you're putting together, similarly to the spindle wall I showed you before, putting together millions of images, you know, literally millions of images that they've taken, are uh, all bits of digital data, and you're creating, you're mapping uh, space. I think that this has yet to be used creatively but there's definitely scope for it, uh, to use it creatively uh, in some area. Sonar as well, it's a different wavelength. You know, uh, you can map the ocean floor with sonar. Uh, it's photography as well, you know. You're using a wavelength to record, record something. So, you know, you're basically exploiting your wavelengths, you're using different wavelengths. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential for this. I haven't seen a huge amount of it uh, creatively or photographically, but I think that there's definitely, definitely some potential. It's something I'd quite like to do some work with, actually. Okay, now we're going to get into what's more traditionally talked about uh, in terms of alternative photography. Um, so. There are many light sensitive materials, not just silver. Right? So, when you're talking about analog photography, you often talk about silver gelatin photography. Right? Now, silver salts, silver bromide, silver chloride, silver iodide, these are the silver salts, silver halides, as they're called. These are light sensitive. Right? But there's lots of stuff that's light sensitive. Um, uh, silver is the quickest light sensitive. So that's what was used, always used for film, uh, and then uh, used for paper as well, because it, it was quicker and uh, cheaper and easier to make uh, light sensitive, commercial light sensitive materials. But there's loads of other light sensitive materials. And dichromics are one of my favorites. Uh, they are one of the most toxic as well, so uh, you know, it's something you have to use gloves 
uh, and pr uh, preferably uh, uh, masks as well when you're working with, because they uh, will give you that sort of thing. No two ways about it, they're extremely dangerous. Um, Even after, like you have a picture of the they're making you sick. <laughs> Look, once you have a picture like a gun print, you wash out most of the chrome, so I wouldn't recommend licking it. Uh, but because there might be residual dichromates, uh, and it's one of those things that builds up in your system, right? So if there's any residual, yeah, you. But but yeah, once you have a finished print, it doesn't have any dichromates in it left. So you'll be okay. But yeah, no, don't lick a gun print because <laughs> yeah, I won't do that. The beautiful thing about dichromates is that they don't create any tone. What they do is they harden gelatin in continuous time, right? So they harden gelatin to different degrees. So what you do, you, what you use dichromates for, you use it for gun printing, you use it for carbon, you also use it for photogravure, I'll show you there. Um, and so what you do is you uh, create, now maybe you've done gun printing, you create a pigmented gelatin, right? Uh, so it's basically you mix a pigment with gelatin, you mix that with a dichromate as well, and you paint that on a sheet of paper. You let that dry, you take a negative, and you expose that under UV light, which we talked about before, and depending on the density of your negative, it hardens the gelatin to different degrees, and then when you wash it out, you get different densities of tone in the gelatin. Right? Uh, and this is a quite nice example uh, by a Finnish chap of a three colour gun print. Um, I was searching for some of them. Actually, I think that's more than a three colour, that's a four or five colour gun print. You can tell by the edges here. You've got yellow there, green there, you've got blue and red. So I think it's actually more than a three colour gun print, it's four or five over there. And then often you have a black layer as well just to boost your boost your uh, shadows. Um, carbon printing, which I haven't got an example, is basically the same, and you do three colour carbon. Um, and what? It's called carbon printing because you use basically carbon tissue. Carbon tissue is uh, what people used to use to make newspapers. It's basically the same. It's to, it's to do uh, carbon, uh, carbon prints out of, yeah, it's basically used to create carbon print and then create a plate print. Uh, you can, uh, carbon print's beautiful, uh, so your carbon tissue, nowadays you have to make it because the newspaper industry doesn't use it anymore, um, so you might as well do, uh, but you can create uh, different coloured tissues and create three coloured carbore uh, and all sorts of different carbon prints, uh, and they are really quite beautiful. Right? For example, so what, so what you'd use in a typewriter? Not that kind of thing. <coughs> no, not quite. Um, but yeah, good, <laughs> good thought, but no, not quite. But yeah, I mean, basically, it's it, it's probably a similar pigment than what you'd use in a typewriter, but it's uh, placed within a... Uh, you know, you can get carbon paper, which you can still... It's not carbon paper, that's not it's not, no. Uh, it's, it's, it, what it basically is, a thin layer of gelatin with a very black pigment inside it. So when you, when you selectively harden it with your negative, what you get is these really deep, beautiful pigmented blacks. So you get these, uh, it's very difficult to do, but so uh, you, get, you, get, you get beautiful deep maps. They're very difficult to achieve uh, with sort of gels and printing. Um, they're very, very nice. Uh, and then first video, now I've uh, shown you a classic here. Um, uh, this is Edward Curtis. Do you guys know who heard of Edward Curtis? Edward Curtis uh, produced extraordinary images. Uh, he had shot all of these 8x10 at least, not much bigger. Uh, and he went to around uh, the United States and shot uh, American Indians and did uh, not more than that, didn't shoot the American <laughs> Indians. <laughs> it sounds like that. Uh, he photographed a lot of American Indians, uh, didn't shoot any of them. And some, some, of them some of them are staged, a lot of them are staged in fact, uh, but they're extraordinary images and they often use traditional dress and they also do a lot of landscapes and he printed them in lots of different ways but one of the most beautiful ways in which you do this is Um Photocrobure is a form of dichroma printing because what you do first of all 
is you create a carbon print, basically. So you create a continuous tone print, and then you use that carbon print, you put that on a copper plate, and you use that as an acid resist. I don't know if anybody's done any printing processes where you've, you know, have you done any etching processes? Okay, so usually in an etching process, you have some kind of resist on top of your plate, which you then put an acid bath and it etches. So these continuous tone carbon prints are placed on top of a copper plate. Those are placed in various different acid etch baths. You create basically a continuous tone copper plate, right? And at the same time, you put aqua tint on there to create wells, but that's the uh, you know, of this thing about it. Uh, so you basically create a continuous tone copper plate, you ink that up, and then you stick that through the press. So you get a three dimensional, effectively three dimensional image. And you can get extraordinary blacks and extraordinary shadows and extraordinary tone ranges. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's literally one of the most beautiful processes. Um, and it takes you about a week to produce a plate. If you're good at it, you know, when they were, when they were doing it commercially, they'd probably produce plates in a day or two. Uh, but, uh, t yeah, I mean, doing it, trying to do it now when the commercial materials aren't available will take you a year. You have to produce, you have to make everything. To make your own carbon tissue, you have to, you have to do everything. So, yeah, it will take you several days to make a plate. Um, and then your plate will last as long as the plate lasts. Copper is soft-ish, so you can usually produce about 50 to 60 prints on Okay, um, this is one of my wet plates. Image here. Um, so, uh, wet plate loading, which is very popular at the moment, is a great alternative silver process. Uh, it uses what people call colloidal silver. But basically, it's just a form of uh, sensitive silver. Uh, and what you're doing is you're uh, creating a light sensitive plate. Now these are all done on tin. Uh, it was never tin. It's never been tin. And this is anodized aluminium, which is brilliant. Uh, trophy aluminium, basically. Uh, uh, and I think it works better than, um, uh, than, other, than other types of aluminium. You can do them on gold-backed aluminium and uh, other types of materials as well. Um, and you can do glass also. You can create natives from them, so you can print from them also. Um, the lovely thing about collodion is that it's extremely, uh, uh, extremely fine grain. It's so fine grain, in fact, that it was used for astronomical photography up until the last decade. So, the grains of collodion resolved such a such a high resolution that you if you take images from a telescope it can resolve the little anomalies the little kind of differences that uh, astronomers use to uh, see where there's a black hole or where there's a, a hidden system or whatever it's extremely high detail um, and it gives a sort of sort of gritty Victorian look to things. As you can see here, this is uh, taken with a large format camera because you've got a little bit of tilt shift here, a little bit of out of focus. That could be a, co a couple of things. That could be the a bit of tilt in the camera, I'm not 100% sure. Or it could just be that the plate was a bit bowed so that the plane of focus was slightly different than the bottom of the plate at the top. It could be one of the two things. Um, I think there's a bit of tilt in there. And you can also see my fingerprint at the top. So you need to... Uh, the, so it's called wet plate because basically uh, what you've got is a, uh, a substrate collodion and then you put this wet, damp collodion into a bath of silver, but it needs to be exactly the right consistency. So if it's too wet, it'll just fall off. If it's too dry, it won't sensitize. And so you test whether it's just the right wetness by putting a fingerprint on the top. If your fingerprint shows up, it's the perfect wetness to go into the silver bath and with anyone sensitized, basically. Is it as cancerous? 
Um, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It can be safe. I'd say, uh, I remember a few years back, there was a vicious argument on one of the, uh, uh, one of the message boards for alternative photography, which has often vicious arguments um, about uh, how dangerous uh, collodion was. Uh, and this, is, this was coming from somebody that uh, always did bichromic printing. Especially, oh, it's cancerous. And I said, but, you, but you work daily with dichromics. And don't use gloves. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, it can be. Look, you, uh, one of the fixes you can use for it is cyanide based. Yeah, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, you, some of the collodion which is used has cadmium in it, which is extremely dangerous as well. Uh, you know, these these are you know this is much more dangerous than mercury. You know, and it will. You know, you get some of that in your bloodstream, you get some of that in your body, it'll build up. That'll never go away. If you get it in there, it'll never go away. So, yeah, cadmium and, uh, and cyanide as a combination is extremely toxic. But it's, it's more toxic to mix it up. Also, you tend to use alcohols like ether, right? Uh, it's toxic. You also get a bit high on it if you're stuck in a room doing collodion or intent doing collodion. Uh, so I've, I've done this sort of uh, at festivals before, and you're in a tent doing collodion for six hours, and at the end of it, you're completely spaced out because you've been sucking in ether all day. You know, it's, it's, you know the, the dentist's favourite. Uh, but at the same time, you don't have to make collodion out of ether. You can just use alcohols, and you don't need to use cyanide to fix. You can just use normal fix. Right? And so it doesn't have to be toxic. You know, you can, you can make it in a non-toxic way. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I, I personally prefer the collodion with ether. Uh, not for the reasons you think, <laughs> because, <laughs> but but because it uh, it's, uh, it it dries a bit better, it dries more evenly, and quick. It's easier to use. Um, it's quicker to use. It's also it's actually physically quicker. It makes the silver a bit quicker. Um, dry paint is like wet plate collodion, but uh, you, uh, uh, it's uh, a little bit later. So wet plate is arguably the first democratization of photography. Not only because it's quick enough to be able to take a portrait of somebody without them needing a headrest and having to sit still for a minute and a half. Right? The Victorians look so glum in photographs, not because they're glum, but because they were held in basically a vice, something holding their neck, and they had to sit still for a minute. <laughs> Try to sit still for a minute and not look long. So, uh, these exposures are in daylight uh, using more than work plates, and they're three to four seconds. So these guys just look long because they want to look long. You can definitely smile in more than work plates. Um, uh, dry plates came a little bit later. Okay, so, yeah, so basically wet plate was the first democratization because it was quicker, but also because the guy didn't patent it. And the chap, uh, uh, his name now also escapes me, uh, but based, he was based in London, he had a studio next to the British Museum, uh, and he developed the wet plate process and then completely forgot to patent it, and so everybody started using it. So you could, with basic grasp of a little bit of chemistry, with a little dark room, you could start producing wet plates. Uh, my parents uh, grew up in Argentina uh, in the say, 50s, and they still remember art photographers, the men who would wander around and would cost you and take your photograph. Uh, and uh, they'd get under a sheet of a large form of camera, and they'd take your photograph, they'd get under there, and then they'd produce it for you. Now the only thing that can be is wet paint. We're still using it in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and uh, it's still, you know, probably not, not because there wasn't still agility, but because you could create an instantaneous image. And you could basically create a Polaroid image and send it to somebody straight away without them having to come back and think about it, decide they don't want the image. They, you know, you cost them, they got excited, you did the picture and then you sold it to them. It's a good, still, uh, yeah, instantaneous, uh, yeah, 
the Victorian polar rules, we call it. Dried plate came later, uh, and uh, it was quicker, um, and it was uh, carried on until probably the 1920s, 1930s, when the first films came out. Um, and uh, was uh, when you find glass plate negatives, those are all dry plate negatives. Uh, and the great thing about that was that you can have uh, a box of glass negatives and they, you'd be able to keep them, you would take them on the mountain, you could take photographs, uh, they would eventually fog, but uh, that's, that's the speed as film does. So you can still find unexposed glass plate negatives, which you can use, which will fog badly, but you can still use them to get negatives, you have images out of them. Um, uh, and so that was sort of the next uh, development of, so the dry plate's next development of uh, commercial photographic negatives, basically. Um, and the next sort of step of uh, democratizing photography. And people who used uh, early box cameras would use, would use dry plate negatives. I put VDB and Solper into here because it's uh, uh, a form of printing process which uses silk processes. Uh, I haven't got an example, but uh, definitely look them up. Salt prints are very nice, they're easy to do. Um, might be able to do a course for that in the summer. Uh, VDB, we're more likely to do, uh, they're also super easy to do. Um, and they're silver and iron. Um, Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about alternative silver processes. Uh, I just wanted to mention platinum palladium as an extremely beautiful um, and difficult process um, and expensive as well. Um, both platinum and palladium salts are extremely expensive. You don't use a lot of them, but um, because they're difficult to do, you end up using a lot of the salts because they tend to not work. So you tend to get one in every five or six because they're so difficult. But, um, but if you find a good teacher, um, uh, and also if you write to me, recommend uh, a chap in London that does it. Uh, uh, well actually, Peter Mosley, uh, he's a very good platinum printer. Uh, and uh, if you want to learn how to do it, it's a beautiful process. Uh, I'd recommend going for Cyanotype and uh, I'll let Brian first <laughs> as uh, starters, but it's definitely worth doing uh, and also creates absolutely beautiful prints. And then uh, Silver Alchemy. Now, uh, as I mentioned to some of you, so is a sort of Photographers that, one of the printers that I really admire, people who can take traditional uh, silver materials, uh, silver papers, and create extraordinary colours and extraordinary images. This is just one that I found uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, it's using uh, Mersch chemistry. It's a chap called Wolfgang Mersch in Germany, who produces a fantastic range of uh, developing chemicals and toners uh, and lith chemicals and all sorts of things. Uh, he is sort of a modern, modern day alchemist uh, and uh, this, is, this isn't him but it's using his chemistry and it's, uh, it's uh, I believe it's a form of split polysulfide toning. Mm -hmm. So he's used two tones here. And it's just sort of gelatin print but uh, it's got sort of greys and burnt oranges and all sorts of beautiful colours in it. Uh, and you can, you can produce all sorts of stuff. Um, just by playing around with different developers, uh, with different toners, uh, and by combining them together. So this actually might be polysulfide and gold split toning. Okay, so another photosensitive material is iron. You have a lot of iron based processes. Um, now I've put uh, an old classic here. Does anybody know who this is? Here. <laughs> Anne Atkins. Um, she was the first, arguably the first female photographer, um, a botanist, a scientist, uh, and she exploited Herschel's discovery of uh, iron based printing uh, to produce beautiful uh, specimens, uh, photograms basically. So she did a lot of photograms of natural objects. And before for photography, people drew them. So it was an approximation. Uh, with photographies, you could create perfect representations of uh, leaves and flowers, all sorts of things. 
Um, now, Anne Atkins was very lucky. She lived somewhere where the water was very acidic. So Anatine loves acidity. Too acidic, of course, but it, uh, if she'd lived in a place with alkaline water, say she lived in London, where the water is very alkaline, um, it wouldn't have worked. It would have bleached, all the prints would have bleached out. But she achieved these beautiful rich blues because the water where she lived, in fact, she had a well. The well water she was very sick. So she washed the prints out. Uh, and um, these beautiful rich blues. Uh, and I think uh, so that was one of the flukes. Um, going back to Thomas Wedgwood, he managed to produce images on, uh, on tanned leather. Uh, and he kind of fluked it because he, he had access to tanned leather and that allowed him to create photosensitive materials. So photography, they mentioned that photography is a mixture of uh, scientific invention and pure fluke. So <laughs> <laughs> probably the uh, invention of photography, uh, or inventions all over the world are mixtures of a pure fluke. Uh, the calotype uh, is uh, a silver process like Van Dyke Brown, which uh, uses uh, an iron base. Uh, and those iron bases are usually either uh, potassium ferrocyanide, right, which I've written up here, uh, or ferric oxalate. Uh, and the chrysotype uses gold chlorant and ferric oxalate. And it's quite a nice print, uh, expensive because it uses gold, but quite a nice use of iron processes. Now, ferrocyanide is actually quite interesting as a, as, a, as a material. If any of you have done any black and white darkroom printing, anybody done a little bit? Yeah? Have you ever done bleaching, toning? Solomon. Uh, a little bit? Solomon. A bit of solarizing, okay. Um, yeah, did you bleach at all? No? Okay, so if you want to tone an image, or if you want to remove something from an image, you can use ferrocyanide to bleach out. But what it does do is it rehalogenates the silver. Um, so it doesn't actually bleach out the silver, it just converts it from silver, solid silver, which is basically what you get when you print, to light sensitive silver. Okay. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back a step and explain what happens uh, when you create a negative or print. Okay, so you start off with a white page which has light sensitive silver on it, right? You expose that, uh, you can do it on the red light so you can see it, you expose it with light. And then when you, and so what you have is silver halides, right? And so the silver halides is exactly the same as what happens in your film. They, uh, are charged with the light. Right? So the more light they have, the more charge they get. Right? And so when you put them that into the developer, you get a redux reaction, a reduction oxidization reaction, and you grow silver. Basically what you're doing, you're a silver farmer in the dark room. <laughs> you're, you're growing silver. Um, and so what the ferrocyanide does and then, and then you, and you fix it, and so then you dissolve the remaining light-sensitive salts, and you're left with basically silver, right? Um, in a, in, not in a form you can make a ring out of, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's basically metallic silver. You put the ferrocyanide back on, what you do is you rehalogenate that, so you make that light-sensitive again. Uh, and then you can redevelop it uh, in different toners or developers, and you can change colours and play around with it. Um, so, First sign over rehalogenate silver, but if you mix it with uh, ferric ammonium citrate, you create cyanotype and you get a blueprint. Uh, if you mix it with uh, if you mix ferrocyanide with silver nitrate, you get a calotype. Uh, if you mix it with gold chloride, you get a chrysotype. Um, now something which you can do, which is quite nice, is start with the base of ferrocyanide and then uh, expose that ferrocyanide. It's actually quicker than combined with the other materials. Uh, and then you can selectively paint on different materials. So you can you can make half of it blue and the rest of it black and a little bit of gold. 
so you can play around with. Uh, they're difficult because uh, the blue type will bleach out the silver type, so you know, you've got to be very careful with the painting, but you can do it, you can sort of play around with it. Um, so that's quite uh, this was on the, um, on the front page of uh, the lecture, and it's lift printing. Now, lift printing is a beautiful way to waste hours in the dark. Mm -hmm. Uh, you basically what you're doing is you're massively overexposing a piece of photographic paper and then you're underdeveloping it. Uh, and what you end up getting is tones, usually coloured tones, and then really strong explosive blacks. So this was fairly silhouette as a as an image, but there was continuous tone and detail. And I've got other versions of this where you can see that there's continuous tone in the faces and stuff like that. But with lift printing, when you get this, you get an explosive black, uh, and then your black just kind of it, it, it so the print comes up extremely slowly, and it can take up to 20, 30, 40 minutes to get a print. Uh, even longer sometimes, it depends on the, the rate of underexposure and the dilution of your chemistry. Uh, and then suddenly you get these explosive blacks and you have to snatch it and stick it into, uh, uh, stick it into a fix or into a wash bath uh, pretty instantaneously, otherwise the whole thing goes black. So it's one of these things where you can sit there and, uh, and then get bored and go off and make a cup of tea and come back and it's completely black. Been there for an hour, and uh, <laughs> it's just completely black. Um, but <laughs> if you if you take your whiskey in with into the darkroom with you, uh, it's uh, it's a very nice slow slow photography process, a very nice printing process, and I'd highly recommend it to anybody who has done any darkroom printing, and even if you haven't done darkroom printing, it's one of these things. Um, I had a student who had done some darkroom printing and become extremely disillusioned with it, thought it was just a, you know, these are her words, just a bunch of beardy old men in, in, in the dark room, you know, it's just, uh, dark room printing can be quite technical, it can be quite sort of, you know, you have to do this and follow the rules. Uh, I taught her lift printing and uh, three years later she's now a full-time artist, pretty much because of lift printing, because it's all about breaking the rules. It's all about uh, it's all about playing. It's it's pure play. It's play in the dark room, and you don't need to be a good printer. You don't. All you need to do is have the capacity to play around and experiment. It's purely experiment. It's a beautiful process. Um, there are still papers you can do it with modern papers, um, the foam papers, the four. They don't have forty papers anymore. Foam. Do you have foam papers? I don't know if you do. Some of the Ilford papers you can still do it with. Um, and there are some vintage papers that you can use as well, uh, which you can still get hold of on eBay, for instance. But yeah, this print was beautiful process. What was this, that picture taken? Uh, this one, uh, that was in Greenwich, I believe. It's a part of Greenwich. Yeah. Looking at the terms. Now, uh, Morden Sarge, uh, Brittany Fletcher, great teacher of Morden Sarge. Uh, she does uh, some other uh, alternative processes as well. Um, and I believe she has is teaching some courses around London now. Um, this is a really interesting, really interesting process. Now you can see here, if you can, this is a piece of normal photographic paper and then this stuff here, this is basically bits of gelatin that are peeling over the edges. Now, one Sarge, I'm going to explain really basically, what happens is you use a chemical process that dissolves uh, the gelatin, basically, it dissolves the gelatin bonds in your spit of silver paper. And the more silver, the heavier it dissolves. So, when you have highlights like this, doesn't dissolve at all, right? But when you have really strong shadows, it starts breaking down the bonds in the gelatin, and so the silver inside the gelatin starts running down. And so 
uh, I've got some uh, there's some videos I think on my Facebook page of it um, which show it happening and as she tilts the tray you just get these globules of silver just kind of running down and so this is this is called veiling um, and so what, you've, what she's done is she's got rid of most of the silver and she's moved the uh, gelatin around to create some veiling effect. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, and, and so, you know, what you have is a three-dimensional image. You, you create sort of a photo sculpture out of your prints. Fantastic, fantastic process. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, this is uh, chrome skedazic, and that is another form of alchemy. Uh, Therese will kill me if she knew I was using this image um, because uh, it's just an experiment. But it's uh, one of one of her uh, one of her images, and we, we did a bunch of experiments with it uh, a few years ago. Uh, and Kremskidazik is about uh, using light, using solarization, and using chemistry to create different colours. Right? So you can create images that look like oil spills, basically. You can get blues and greens and all sorts of strange colours. Uh, and it's sort of basically a form of controlled solarization with chemistry to create uh, sort of oil slicks in your paintings. And then uh, I've uh, given you an example of a chemogram, uh, uh, Pierre Cordier chemogram. Pierre Cordier is the father of chemograms, uh, but you can do far less complex ones uh, at home just with photographic paper. So, if you have some photographic paper, which you can see by small photographic paper, or even new stuff, it doesn't really matter. Um, but old stuff that's fogged, uh, that isn't much use for anything else, is brilliant for chemograms. Uh, and that is basically just using, also similar to chromoscopes as it, but using chemistry to create uh, light images. And he does these fantastic, uh, fantastic geometric shapes. How does he do that? It's a mixture of, uh, so it's a mixture of bleaching, exposing and developing, um, yeah, how he does these I'm not entirely sure, they're amazing, yeah, they're really good. But it's, is it, it's, he draw onto it or is it like No, it's all done chemically, oh, okay. it's all done chemically, yeah. I think he's painting with chemicals, so he may be drawing. Uh, on it, as it were, but he's using chemicals for paint. So I think what he's doing is he's probably selectively exposing, then doing various geometric shapes with developer, yeah? and then he's bleaching various shapes as well. And probably what he uses is, he probably uses masks and stuff to do it. I mean, he does it now, but, so. but yeah, check, check him out, his, his work is really amazing. Um, you can do all sorts of chemograms. So, like, uh, there's one which is quite famous, which uh, I didn't put up, which is uh, uh, s somebody got a rabbit, a dead rabbit, right, and put it on a bit of photographic paper. And so the chemicals that seep out of the rabbit over its dead composition create, uh, react with the chemicals in the photographic paper. And so what you end up getting after, I don't know, he left it on there for a couple of weeks and then peeled the rabbit off. Uh, <laughs> pleasant, isn't? Uh, and then, and then what you got is this kind of weird outline of a rabbit, and then all its innards have kind of like you know the, all the ammonias and all the other chemicals that seep out of his stomach came out to this kind of it's kind of chemogram of entrails plus photographic paper. That's uh, people, people do that to you with <laughs> You don't have to be so, you know, you don't have to be so obtuse or um, uh, show so much animal cruelty. Uh, but uh, you can also do with uh, rotting, other rotting materials, and rotting fruit or also. And, and fr rotting fruit is nice, because when things rot, they create quite a lot of nice chemicals that do react with photographic paper, because it's basically a chemical object, photographic paper. And so you can do quite nice, kind of play around with images and, and play around with sort of materials. Um, uh, I, I know people use, uh, you know, use urine or use other spit on things and use urine to play around with it. It's quite common. Um, 
And, uh, and then, of course, uh, using classic materials in slightly different ways. Um, uh, you can positive print using negative materials. Um, and uh, this is one of an example of using a uh, reversal film, but processing it as negative film. Uh, and this, if you, you know, if you just get slide film, process it as uh, negative film, you get these, uh, you can get lots of beautiful different colours. This is Fuji film. Uh, Fuji film, I think it's, oh no, no, no. Yeah, I think it is Fuji actually. Uh, different, different slide films push different colours, right? So, so Fuji and Kodak uh, and Agfa, which you don't get anymore. Um, the slide film, the reversal films work in slightly different ways. Okay, they're all sort of bespoke uh, processes. You had to, you remember, anybody remembers using slide film? You had to send it off to the particular manufacturer to get it processed, right? Uh, that's because they use slightly different processes, with very slightly obtuse. But it means that if you process it as negative film, it pushes slightly different channels. So if Fuji film pushes the green channel, and Kodak often pushes the red channel. For instance, uh, so but you can also do the other way around. So you can process uh, negative film as reversal film, and then you get all sorts of weird colours. Uh, you can also uh, use standard black and white materials and uh, process them positive, positive process. So you use a positive print with a positive and create a positive. The negative and create a negative. Um, and that's very easy to do. Uh, just, just as it's very easy to create a slide with standard black and white film. So if you've got something like uh, Tri-X, which is a great film, which we're talking about before. The other great thing about Tri-X, other than it being very versatile and being able to push it a lot, is that you can reverse the processor. So you can you can take it and create slides, black and white slides. Mm. Um, and yeah, you can. So yeah, you can sort of play around with materials, positive and negative. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more examples here. Um, there's a British photographer that does uh, this stuff here. Um, can anybody really guess what that is? Belief in the butterfly. Belief in the butterfly, yeah. How do you think that's done? I guess you just come with a leaf and suck it right in and expose it to somebody. That's, that's absolutely right, yeah. That's exactly what you do, yeah. So, what somebody's doing is exploiting the fact that leaves are photosensitive. So, the stuff that's covered, the black bits of the negative, don't receive any light. And so they bleach out. And the other bits do receive light, so it's fresh leaf. And so you actually get continuous tone. It's amazing, really. Uh, there's a lot of people that work with that, uh, very easy to do. Uh, works with green leaves better. Um, uh, yeah, that's, I always thought that was a beautiful expression of uh, uh, natural photography. Now, of course, if you put, you can do your own uh, photograms in your wall at home just by putting a picture up. You put a picture up and then you take it down three years later and you have a photogram of, uh, the, shape of the shape of your picture just because the, but your wall has ended up discolouring with the light. And that's just usually a function of paint in your homes so that will discolour over time with light. So you can create, you know, uh, there's another there's another one which I always think is brilliant, which is sort of chlorophyll uh, printing. And then you you could exploit this uh, artistically, and people have done. Um, but uh, if you uh, when you leave festival, if you're one of the last to go, and you see where all the tents have been, and you can see all these it looks like you know alien spaceships that have uh, landed and taken off. So you have all these yellowed patches, and they're all photographs. You know, everybody that pitches a tent in a festival is creating a tent photograph. 
Um, and then the last one here is bitumen printing. Now this uh, is uh, Chapo's of it. I did this with the late Terry King, uh, who was uh, a brilliant, if not only cantankerous, uh, alternative photographer based out in Richmond. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years ago, but uh, he was one of the first uh, pioneers in, in the UK working with alternative photography, and as we remember very warmly. Um, and he introduced me to the bitumen process. Um, bitumen is what we make roads out of. Uh, uh, bitumen of Judea, right? Uh, and if you melt that down, melt the bitumen down, mix it with lavender oil, and coat it onto a plate, it is light sensitive. It's extremely slow. Uh, it will take, he, he, these aren't in camera images, he uses digital negatives here. Uh, but this, so this is, he's coated this plate with bitumen and lavender, uh, and some alcohols as well, and creates a very thin layer of bitumen. And then, what I read on his website, he's put a digital negative on top and he's exposed it for 18 hours direct sunlight. And then you use uh, a variety of different alcohols and ethers to very, very, very carefully uh, wash it on. Uh, and you get this slightly solarized, polarized image, uh, which if you shine light on, will go from negative to positive. And actually you can sort of see He's clearly got a flashlight over here, and you can see it's sort of flipping from negative to positive with the light. Uh, this is one of the very, very earliest uh, forms of photographic printing, and uh, Terry didn't think you could do anything but photographs, but you clearly can do digital negatives as well. Um, oh, and then one more. Uh, this guy is, uh, he's one of my favorite photographers, and I've got his book here if you want to have a look at it. Uh, he has uh, basically worked with extremely long exposure. Right? So this picture on the left is, I think, uh, it's one of the shorter ones he did. So I think it's over the course of three or four weeks. It's uh, an office. Uh, as you can see, things like the windows and the door and the bookshelf didn't discernibly move. The desk, you can pretty much see, didn't move at all. The chair is a blur, because that moves quite a lot. Uh, and then there's no people in it, of course, because they don't show up. He took this technique, and he expanded it. And you can work out how long this exposure is by counting the number of times the sun crosses the sky. This is the sun crossing the sky. I believe the, this is the construction of Moma in New York. Might be wrong about that. Uh, but I also believe it's an 18 month exposure. Now, what's particularly interesting about this, what you can see is that you can see stuff scaffolding, right? So you can see the stuff that was the, the beginning of the exposure, and then things get, we get more and more shadowy as the exposure develops. Now, what's really, really interesting about these, these light trains here is that, okay, so every Every six months, the light, uh, the sun crosses its opal. Every three months, it crosses the same path. And so, when you have gaps here, what that means is that the sun was obscured by a cloud at that point of day simultaneously uh, during six points in the exposure. So, there's always a cloud there <laughs> at that time of day. Uh, during that exposure, otherwise it would just be a straight line. So you've got areas, times of the year, which are probably very cloudy. So probably what you're looking at is, uh, is winter here, and then summer here. They're really amazing, yeah, definitely worth having a look at. But how do you do for 18 months? And that over 12 um, do you know? I don't know exactly, but uh, he would have used very, very slow material. It's an extremely slow film. That won't make a huge amount of difference. Black and white film, okay? So your benefit with black and white materials is that you have reciprocity failure. But you don't have in uh, digital, digital materials. Right? So you can do super long exposures because after about a second, 
the um, linear relationship between exposure time uh, and uh, yeah, so exposure time breaks down basically. So uh, where you usually have, let's say, after a second, you know, it's, uh, if you'd have technically it would be a two second exposure, you actually have to expose for four. So reciprocity fairly helps him. He would have used uh, very slow film or paper. I think he used film here. He would have uh, probably used pinhole. Might have used film. Uh, might have used a lens. Uh, he would have stopped it down massively. So very very small aperture. Uh, he would have used uh, a huge amount of neutral density filtration. And actually, I think probably it's more likely that he used huge quantities of ND filters. That's probably what he did for an 18 month exposure. I'd say I don't know, probably put 10 ND filters together. He might even put a bit of film in front of it. Now. Putting film in front, film is an ex exceptionally good ND filter, so if you have some black exposed film, so you accidentally took it out of the camera, develop it, keep it, because they make the best, uh, best filters for watching solar eclipses. <laughs> yeah, good to know. <laughs> now that's it. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you.